why is stateful static bad? Well, in general, in, in general, anytime like the two words again, they're kind of at odds, right? Static is the implication that there's one of something, and like running state is fine, as in like there is a singleton state. But it comes back to intentionality again. It's the fact that if you have something that's stateful and static, you are saying there is a single instance of this thing, and it has this state. And just in in almost every practical application in software, it's very rarely guaranteed that something is a single concept and it has a single state. So if you are going to use singletons, one of the best use cases for them is if you lean into more of a functional style. So you can have functional singletons, which are effectively tools that have no state. And so it doesn't actually matter how many instances you have. So a good example of this is stuff you're probably using already without thinking about it is the mathf class or you're using um, time I don't like because that is stateful. But <laughs> but if you're, look, if you're using stuff like mathf, you are using helper objects where realistically all you're doing is removing duplicate code. It makes sense for these kinds of things to have static functions or to be static instances because they don't really have, there would be no reason for you to duplicate that class. Even if you could make two instances of the mathf class, literally there'd be no point because they physically aren't different. They cannot be different. And so, um, yeah. So and, and they're deterministic. The, well, except for time. So it's like you can mm -hmm. test those. I, th I think t like time is one of those I'd probably wrap, like wrap it up, you know, just so I can test certain parts of my code if I needed to test. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that that's a good point. You know, it, people are like, uh, are a lot of developers, you'll read a lot of things saying that static classes are the death of testing, you know, but there are cases like like helper, helper classes that, uh, you know, it is okay to have use statics. Yeah, and to kind of uh, segue to that, to the, the most recent comment, is um, with pure functions. Mm -hmm. um, so to go into even further weeds between you've got ECS as an, as an architectural idea, object orientation is another, and then uh, you can basically do functional style programming. And there's, there's a kind of a very funny subsection of development these days where people swear that functional is the future. It's just the way programming is and that all I've things see, should I've be functional. Seen that. Yeah, what's that uh, about? <laughs> it, it drives me insane because functional programming is great. It's actually really, really cool. And technically, it's actually older than object-oriented programming In if you want to go down into the weeds of the, or, or, yeah, the origins of languages. Mm -hmm. But they're not even – they're not competing with each other. They are, they are tools that can solve problems. So you can have – one of them is a hammer. One of them you know, is a screwdriver. And you use the one that you need when you need it. Um, how, whether you're arguing if a language should be – um, a functional language. I, I don't know, that seems like an archaic way to go to kind of gate your language to be functional only when you have a language like C Sharp where you can literally write functional code if you want to. Now, there's some arguments about whether it's true functional, but it is. It's as good as functional in terms of any practical sense that you need it to be. Um, as, for, as for why you would or wouldn't, it's the same kind of idea, right? You use ECS because it is more memory efficient in terms of marshalling data and being faster. You use object orientation when your objective is to partition your code into easy to use chunks and to stack them into more interesting ways and to swap parts out. Uh, you use functional programming when you have uh, challenges that you need to do where you, you want to avoid risks of danger between state changes. You wanna deal with things like concurrent problems or you wanna deal with, um, like money is a great candidate for uh, functional software. If you're doing banking type software, it doesn't matter that it takes far more cycles and you're duplicating large chunks of memory. And there's a lot of um, a lot of problems. Like functional game development is an insane idea if you understand what functional programming is for and how game development works. You can technically do it, but they're kind of at odds with each other. And so understanding what the point of a framework or system or architecture is will really help you answer these questions. So rather than should I use X when I Y, um, have a look at what problems that particular thing was designed to solve. So functional programming was built to solve problems with things like concurrency and to make testing easier on things like large algorithms. A very good example is literally maths. You have pure functions where they take in data and given the same deterministic data, you'll get the same thing out every time. And so because of that, you can compose these to make more complex statements. That is a really good case of having recursion where you can have the same functions call themselves and guarantee you'll get the same inputs and outputs. So it has its place, but its place isn't every problem, just like object-oriented isn't every problem. So yeah, anybody who says everything should be functional now, I don't think they even understand what functional means because <laughs> that's not true <laughs> in any practical sense. <laughs> yeah.